Welcome to The Human Reboot with me, Emma Last. We have uplifting, inspiring and diverse reboot stories from people sharing the courageous, honest, authentic and sometimes difficult life lessons. The Human Reboot will provide proven mentally flourishing formulas and practical tips to help you to live life to the full, giving you direction and hope. Make your mental fitness and well-being a daily priority. Learn to pause so that you can get clear and perform at your best. Switch off to switch on. It's time for your Human Reboot. On the Human Reboot podcast today, I have with me David Leach. David is a partner in Crusader First Aid and Mental Health and Wellbeing, an organisation offering training and coaching to adults and children in both physical and mental health. Um, David is a qualified teacher of over 20 years um, and has worked across the education spectrum in primary, secondary, maintained and private sectors in a range of roles from teacher to head teacher. He's really passionate about smashing the stigma around poor mental health and changing the narrative for those suffering in silence. Welcome, David. Hi, Emma. Thanks for having me. You are very welcome. Well, we met uh, in February 2020, didn't we? In the um, sunny town, city, not quite sure what it is, of Bath. Uh, And um, it was when David was becoming a mental health and wellbeing trainer. And I was, I had the pleasure of training him. And um, I was just pretty much impressed from the um, the moment that he started talking and introduced himself. And actually, he was like hugely vulnerable um, about his kind of story from that moment. So tell us a little bit about uh, about the work that you do and the mission that you're on. Yeah, um, it doesn't seem like it was 2020. That's That's gone very quickly. But yeah, the... The journey that I've been on since changing careers is really to help to promote and give a voice to, as I said before, you know, those, the people who suffer in silence. And for too long, mental health has been something that we've been ashamed of, perhaps. Uh, we've, we've tarred mental health with the poor mental health brush. So when we refer to our mental well-being, we are always you know, slant it with a negative um, vibe which isn't the case. And it's just really my mission now is to, as you said, to smash the stigma around mental health um, for all people, regardless of gender, uh, creed, anything like that at all. It's just basically to make sure that everyone has a voice, that everyone recognises that we all have a mental health, that our mental health can fluctuate. It's a dynamic state that uh, can change from one minute to the next. And it's making sure that we understand that, but equally we're kind to each other and we're kind to ourselves. And I think that's something I've learned over certainly the last few years where I spent an awful lot of time in my life uh, not being kind to myself and I've, you know, I would talk to myself in a way that I would definitely never talk to a child in my care um, and I would you know my inner voice was was often very negative and very critical and so it's about learning about those issues and, and learning to switch off and certainly I know with your human reboot, reboot and um, making sure that we understand that we're able to just switch off and that's okay and I talk a lot with clients now that I life coach and professional coach about being selfish. And um, I'm sure we'll explore that further. But yeah, it's, it's basically making sure that we understand that we are human. That we will make mistakes, that we're not perfect, that we don't match up to an Instagram profile or a Facebook page and that no one does. And to recognize that actually what we've got is really important. And that's the most important thing about us is our personal life and our personal journey nothing to do with you know a job title or a career or what's in the bank uh, all of those things are ancillary and it's taken me a while to to, to come to terms with the fact that actually that David matters more than Mr Leach and more than a career or a job title so it's been a it's been a, a rapid um, learning curve but it's actually just been a, a rapid assimilation of knowledge that I really already had and now it's uh, kind of putting that into place and hopefully hopefully helping people to um avoid the pitfalls that I fell into, but also once you have fallen into pitfalls to celebrate that as part of your tapestry of life. And actually I've been re my, my own reboot has brought me back stronger and, uh, and more in passion to, to help people in a different way. So my teaching days might in education might be slightly different now, 
uh, but still on that mission to, to help those uh, I could possibly can. Oh, thank you. And so much of that resonated with me as well, because I think when, when we met, um, we talked about, you know, our stories and, you know, how driven we were and passionate about our careers. And literally our path was just like, even though we were in different sectors, obviously I was, I had, um, you know, worked with schools, but I wasn't, uh, you know, an educator as such. And, um, but it was really interesting when we almost kind of told our stories and the similarities that came out and then almost the journeys that we've been on since. So we've brought you on the human reboot today to be able to tell your reboot story. So please, would you uh, share that with me and please try not to make me cry this time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's, it's a story that kind of began well when I when I reflect back on life I think I've always as a, as a child I had anxiety and uh, wasn't really recognized as being such but certainly I recognize now through my own children the anxieties that they have um, and you know the anxieties that I've worked with other children you know and, and some certain people diagnosed with severe anxiety disorders or things like that and I think I had an anxiety um, throughout my childhood, I never really recognised as being that. I thought I just didn't like certain situations, so I would avoid. And so I, I work a lot now with avoidance tactics and uh, working with people who are in that sort of zone. And so it's quite interesting looking back now on actually my experiences of that. But I would say my acute mental, sort of poor mental health started, I would say, probably about five years ago. Um, and it was just the relentless nature of work. And the relentless stress of being a head teacher in a maintained school um, and trying to divvy up my time between school and the, you know, the position that school was in when I took over, um, pending sort of, you know, Ofsted and things like that, you know, the pressure that that brings, but also having a young family and trying to juggle um, those two roles uh, was, was challenging. And I think what, what happened over time was actually I became more Mr. Leach and less David. And I lost sight of actually what was really important. And I thought that the, the role actually looking back now became all consuming. Yeah. And it was, un- I was unable to switch off from it in the end. Um, I say I would probably became 90% of me was Mr. Leach and uh, 10% was David. And th- that was, you know, towards the end of my um, sort of the build up as it were to to my poor mental health or being diagnosed as it were my diagnosis was probably the sort of ground zero I suppose but the towards that I think I gradually became 99% Mr Leach and 1% David and I couldn't actually remember what it was that brought me joy or pleasure or things like that I just I, I fell into what I now know was depression where I was sat in a, in a position of nothingness and I felt very numb I felt very isolated I felt very uh, distant from a lot of things, you know, from the people who love me and still do to this day. And they've, you know, they've been a, always a massive source of inspiration for me, but also a source of guilt. And I still harbor sometimes of how could I let it get to that point where, um, you know, where my loved ones almost came second in, in, in some regards, you know, in terms, certainly in, t- in terms of time. Um, I was working hard for them, but actually as a consequence, they became very, um, I suppose time deprived as it, as it were so you know my time was spent mostly chasing my tail in work rather than actually spending quality time with them and I was very much guilty of presenteeism um, in, in, in the home so I would be there uh, but actually I could be quite absent in terms of my thoughts and I could be you know I was present in physically physically but actually in you know, my thought processes and things like that, my head was still in work mode and I, I found it very difficult to reboot that so that's when it ended up in getting to the crisis point of, um, of seeking help. Uh, and that was really, it was, a, it was a, a quite a trivial situation in school that just, t- you know, just tipped me over the edge. Um, something that probably in the previous 20 years of, of education wouldn't have phased me at all. But I just got to that point where it literally was the last drip that, that made the ceiling come in. You know, the leak was in the ceiling for quite some time and we hadn't noticed it. Um, and so with that last little drip that caused the ceiling to cave in, and um, I resigned from work and I came home and saw my wife and just started crying and, and she didn't know what was going on. I didn't really know what was going on. 
I couldn't articulate what was going on in my head because it was just a melee of thoughts that I couldn't articulate where one started and one stopped. So I couldn't um, differentiate between one thought and the other. And it was just almost like a frenzied state where I couldn't physically express what was going on in my head. Yeah. Um, and as a result of that, it was just came out in tears and emotion. And I remember getting home and she was upstairs at the time. I came upstairs and just hugged her. She was, you know, it was about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. She said, what are you doing home now? Um, and I just cried and we just hugged and she said, no, and she asked me what was wrong. And I couldn't articulate what it was. And I still to this day really couldn't uh, put a, you know, my finger on exactly what it was. But just getting that emotion of saying, actually, do you know what? I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I can't cope with it anymore. That was the catalyst really for me recognizing that there's something wasn't quite right. Um, I didn't go to the doctor straight away because, of, uh, again, it was a bit of burying your head in the sand. It was a bit of, I don't know if it was male pride or what, I don't know, but certainly it was just a case of actually, I just need to rest. I need to switch off and all that sort of stuff. So I thought by sleeping a lot, which I did for the first four days, um, I thought that would, that would make me feel better because I was physically and mentally exhausted, but it didn't improve things. The anxiety, the panic, the, the guilt, the constant thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not in school. I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have more and more stuff to go back to. Um, it's just building and so it wasn't until I went to see the doctor and he diagnosed me with depression quite quickly um, having sort of spoken to him he, he said no and I always remember his the compassion that my GP showed me I'll never ever forget that um, it was kind of a, a beacon of light really in, in a real dark place and he, he turned around to me then and said, you know, David, don't worry, we can fix this. We can, we can, uh, you know, you're not always going to feel like this. And it was such a relief to kind of, uh, to know that this wasn't going to be a permanent thing, that actually I could get back to David again, mm. because it seemed so far away. It was like standing, you know, Everest base camp and being told you need to climb it three times in the next 24 hours. Uh, it just seemed unachievable and insurmountable. Um and then he medicated, so I went on to um, an antidepressant, and that was the first time I'd ever had any, any experience of, of, of any sort of um, poor mental health, and certainly my first experience of medication for it. So uh, I didn't really know much about it, and I didn't really have one view or another. All I knew was, actually, if it made me feel better, then I'll do whatever he wanted me to do. So he gave me those. Um, I went off, he signed me off work, and he, I was going to go back and see him in, in two weeks' time. Um, and it was an immediate relief of actually, do you know what? It's almost, it wasn't like it had gone away, but it was pressed pause. And at that moment, that's what I needed. However, when it came up to working back up to the two weeks time, going back to see the GP, then the anxiety was through the roof again, because the thought of going back on that treadmill that I'd been on a hundred miles an hour was really uh, very uh, scary, I suppose. And, um, and it just felt, you know, un un unattainable again. So, I went through the journey with him and he's been very supportive. I started signing up for talking therapy as well. So that was a self-referral would happen for that. And I've been triaged a few times and I don't know if you, uh, any of the listeners to this podcast will empathize with the fact that talking therapy is brilliant once you get into it, but it's kind of getting there is the problem. So you, you know, you, I think I was triaged five or six times before I even spoke to anyone about any issues that I had, but um, it made me recognize that as an employer, I'd signed up to an employee assistance program through work and I accessed some counselling through that. And I recognised then actually the employee, the employee assistance program that I'd signed up for that I thought, brilliant, all my staff have got access to this. This can really help them, blah, blah, blah. It was absolutely useless. Um, I spoke to a very nice lady um, in, I think she was in Scarborough, I think. Um, and I remember talking to her at the time and, and as I was talking to her, and I didn't, I, I signed up to this program not knowing what the counselling was going to be available and things. Anyway, I started talking and she just started expressing things like, oh, my shoulders feel really tight. Are yours, David? Um, and, you know, more, I've got a real, my headaches really. Oh, oh, I've got a real bad headache. Have you got a bad headache? And in the end of the call, the 30 minute session on the phone to this counsellor, in inverted commas, I was actually more concerned for her welfare than I was for my own. So I was saying, oh, you get to speak to <laughs> oh my you? goodness. So I've offloaded all this stuff onto her and I'm going, who do you get to speak to? Who do you offload? Who, do you have supervision? Do you have blah, blah, blah? So I was kind of, still in that pastoral mode um, of looking after. So I was more worried about not going to her and felt guilty about <laughs> yeah. that. So anyway, I carried on doing that until talking therapies happened. Um, 
I wasn't really getting any better. The, the I was on fluoxetine at the time as an antidepressant, and that was having some side effects. And uh, after six weeks, I think I went back. I think it was six weeks. I went back to my GP and said, "Look, should I be feeling any different now? Because I don't really feel any different." And he said, "Well, there's lots of different options we had." So we decided to um, change my antidepressant. I went on to sertraline and uh, started the journey with that, which then. We know now, you know, that when you're onto those sorts of medications, it can make you feel worse before you start to feel better. And that definitely was the case. I, I had sort of side effects of nausea and uh, things like that and affected my sleep and things. And um, so we reduced the dose, played around with it. And actually made in the end, after two weeks, it actually started to be all right. The nausea had passed and I just had to place my faith in the system and my doctor to say, actually, believe that and it will start to feel better. And it really did. Um, but alongside that, my journey then and my sort of self-discovery happened regarding self-care as well, because I found I got into a position whereby before I had my poor mental health sort of diagnosis, my self-care was abysmal and I was doing nothing for myself. I was doing um, I was literally working, getting home, eating, you know, uh, drinking, sleeping, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, yeah, we, we talked about time. that, didn't we, about um, how you used to play golf and everything and that just all kind of, you'd yeah. all but you, like over time when you look back, all like your hobbies and the things that you love had slipped, like slipped away. Yeah. I mean, my therapist asked me down the line, you know, so what do you do t- t- for you? What do you do to relax? And I said, oh, I like playing golf. He said, great. So when did you last play? And I was sitting there and I couldn't remember. And it worked out, it was, it was almost seven years before that I'd last played golf. Um because I was working such long hours, actually to go out on a Saturday and spend four or five hours playing golf further away from the children and from the wife. And it just made me feel guilty about doing that. So that went, I used to go to the gym, but that was in the evenings. And so that went uh, because I couldn't get in. A, I didn't have the energy, but B, it was again, getting home and then going out again. So it was again, this internalized guilt. It was, it was only from me. It was nothing to do with my wife and the children or anything like that. It was all the pressure I was putting on myself. Um, and so all basically all the things I now know that are really good for me, I wasn't doing. I was self-medicating an awful lot in terms of drinking excessively. So I was ending up, you know, a bottle of wine a night wasn't a rarity. Um, and actually, I would then got to the point where if I don't have a glass of wine or, you know, which turned into two or three or a bottle, then I wouldn't sleep. And because uh, my sleep was all over the place. So I start, started self-medicating for that. So actually I was drinking, I'd have a glass of wine and blah, 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 and then, it, I would, then I'll get to sleep, which worked. And I would fall asleep, but three o'clock in the morning, I'd be wide awake. And the anxiety that then builds, obviously the depressive a- aspect of alcohol as well in the system uh, just made it worse. So actually what I was doing, what I thought was going to help me sleep, but actually now you know, in hindsight and in, you know, in, in through rational eyes was actually counterintuitive and counterproductive. Um, tie that in with then, also, then I have weight gain in terms of not exercising and then drinking and eating bad foods and takeaways because I couldn't be bothered to cook. And this scale you know, started to um, literally the scale started to tip, but but the actual scale of the problem started to get bigger as well. So it was a recognition of actually the bad habits that I got into, uh, but actually recognizing that they were bad habits because they just became normal. Um, and so, yeah, it was perhaps a bit about that. And then. Uh, through the treatment and started to to look at things and started to get closer to I was I was uh, put onto a low intensity cognitive behavior therapy which was every two weeks on the phone and I was away at the time in Wales and um, yeah when I got back from Wales it was the, the, the looming I was looking to return back to work in September and this was the end of August now or sort of the yeah, late August and um, the thought of that I didn't realise was playing on my mind. So the, the final week of our week on in, of our holiday in Wales was a write-off because I was too concerned and uh, my thought processes were falling back to work and the dread feeling that you get. You know that the summer holiday dread, you know, when you're a kid and you sort of yeah. you're going back to school, you know, that, that butterfly feeling, but also it's it's that times a million, you know, the yeah. anxiety spikes and then turns into almost like panic attacks things. Um and so, yeah, that's when it was that after that point that that's when my mental health really, really, really suffered. Um, my wife and children went away for a, a night or two when we got back from holiday and I didn't feel up to going. So I stayed at home and that's where I, I, my mental health really took a downturn, um, where suicidal thoughts started to enter into my thinking and um, the suicidal ideation became 
rational thought really and it was I would sort of got to a dark place where I'd considered doing you know things to myself and um and it was yeah it was a really bad place to be I was physically and emotionally exhausted and I, I felt like I didn't have the energy to go on for another second let alone another day yeah um so I, you know, I'd made a plan of what I was going to do um and fortunately for me my dog uh, I only have one dog at the time, but he Boris came in and sat on my lap, and that little bit of contact made me think and pause. Um, I went to bed and thought, if I still felt like this in the morning, I can do something about it. But um, let's just buy some time and see what happens. When I woke up in the morning, uh, I felt horrendous, uh, absolutely horrendous. A uh, tsunami of guilt hit. Uh, how could I possibly even think about doing that to the people I love most in the world? And uh, and I went back to my GP and told told him what you know how I was and he was very supportive and my therapy changed from being a low intensity to high intensity and I met once a week with my therapist and um yeah and I had to basically then start a a real prioritization of myself but actually as, as a result of that um looking at getting myself out of the situation that I dug into um for the benefit of those around me and to make sure I could be the best version of David for them that I could possibly be. And uh, I wasn't being that for a long time. They stuck by me through all the times when I was just in a hole. Um, and so now I needed, I owed that to them to make the best concerted effort to get out of that hole, to be David again, to be dad again, to be you no know, husband again. And so that's where my sort of reboot started in earnest really. And it was, that was the real, no bottom of the pit and it was now a case of what can I do to get myself out of the pit yeah. and it was really utilizing the people around me so it wasn't something I did by myself it was my it was my GP it was my therapist it was my my friends my family my wife in particular uh, my parents were amazing um, children again I'd, I'd now spoken to my children in, in great detail about the mental health and my journey and things like that and just spoken to them about it and they They've given me some of the best advice I've ever been given, you know, and to hear my son and daughter who was seven and 11 at the time or six and 10 um, to come up with some real pearls of wisdom, you know, to say, you know, and, and, and it, was, it really resonated me, with me at one point when I was on a walk with my son, I'd left the job and I'd changed careers and this was during lockdown and, and um, he turned around to me and said, uh, dad, do you miss being a head teacher? And I said, well, not really. I said, I, I really miss the children. I miss the staff. I don't miss the job. And he turned around and said, uh, Dad, I really don't miss you being a head teacher. And I said, oh, why is that? And he said, because we get, we've got you back now. And uh, <laughs> it still chokes me up thinking about it. But, um... I know that is, I mean, that that is just, but it's so easy for that to happen, isn't it? You know, yeah. over time, things happen and happen and happen. And um, so when you started talking, so you said on that, when you first started to realize you had poor mental health and you came home, you said that you had kind of resigned that day. So were you, did they kind of persuade you to stay? So it was almost like you were trying, you knew what was right, the right thing to do, even though you really didn't know what the heck was going on with yourself at the time. But yeah, yeah I, I basically reached the, the decision to resign because I couldn't take it anymore. It was kind of that relentless nature of um, of the treadmill and uh, the speed at which it was, and, and it was just it, you know, I would achieve one thing and then it would be the next thing. You know, the pressures are always on. So I just got to the point where I, the only way out I could see at the time was to resign. Um, the school was supportive in terms of they gave me some time and said, "Look, we'll take some time to think about this and uh, and see what happens, you know, and we, we don't, we're not going to accept your resignation just yet. We want you to stay, but, you know, we want you to be well. Um, so they gave me some time to think about that. It kind of shoved the issue down the road, I suppose, in terms yeah. of that. But I didn't know at the time because I thought, well, maybe if I do get better, um, maybe it will be all right. And actually now today, you know, if, if you, people often ask me, you know, will I go back into it? Well, I, do I want to be a head teacher again and all that sort of stuff? And that's it. And I said, there's, diff there's two different questions there. You know, could I do it? Yes, I could. Uh, would I do it? I'd have to think very seriously about that because the quality of life that I have now is so much different to what it was. And mm. my my work to live as opposed to live to work uh, balance is completely changed. Um, 
So yeah, it was kind of kicking the can down the path, but I appreciated the respite at the time. Um, it bought me time to actually think about making myself better and, and thinking about accessing the help that I needed to, to enable myself to start a journey to, to that conversation with my son where actually you know, my children feel like they've got their dad back now, which is amazing. Um, but it's just been creating those, it's, it's that juxtaposition really of it's amazing that my children feel that dad's back and they've got him again. But it's really sad that actually they felt that dad wasn't there as well. That my yeah. seven-year-old could recognise that something was different. And a job had done this to me and the job had driven me to prioritise that, you know, the, the, the role rather than you know, that, because you know, rather than my family, because you know, for certain times during, during my headship, um, I think my wife was a single parent. Um, and that makes me feel really sad as well. And she, she carried the, you know, the burden for both of us for, for a lot of the time. And, um, you know, I can never you know, thank her enough for that. But equally, I can never get rid of the guilt that I put her in that situation whereby she would ever have thought that actually she was like a single parent or, you know, she's never thrown that back in my face or anything like that. She's just not that sort of person. But that's all internalised guilt for me to say, bloody hell, you know, how did I get to the point whereby I just, you know, I became 99% job and 1% and David. And that's, that's, so that's, that was kind of my, my realisation really that um, things needed to change and, um you know, after the dark times when I was in a place that wasn't very nice, uh, I recognised then that actually something needed to change. And it was uh, it was actually a conversation with my dad that really was uh, a light bulb moment and then uh, almost taking the, the pressure off or taking the, you know, the weight that I've been carrying around, the yoke that I've been carrying on my shoulders for a long time. And it was recognising after that um, episode where I was in a really bad place. I went out for a walk with my dad, who I didn't know this, but my wife had phoned my dad and my GP to speak to them. She was really worried about me. Um, and the so my dad came around and said, right, come on, son, we're going for a walk. And we went for a walk and uh, we were chatting as we go. And I've got a really close relationship with my parents and I'm you know, very grateful for that. And um, we, as we were chatting about stuff and um, we ended up in a pub. We'd earned that because we'd uh, we walked for a few miles and we went and had, 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 um, <laughs> had lunch. And, and a couple of points and we carried on our conversation and he basically said look um i don't think you're in a position to make the decision and i said oh what do you mean he said because and he actually hit the nail on the head i was in a school that i loved uh that meant an awful lot to me in a role that i loved um working with the children and the staff with the staff you know and, and all those that i really cared for and i, I had great friends on the staff so it was almost like leaving a relationship rather than leaving a job. And so to make the decision, I knew it was like, well, I don't want to leave um, the job because I miss, I, I know I love the people. Um, and it was, it was, yeah, it was like sort of making the decision to end the relationship. And it was actually my dad that said to me, look, you're, you need someone to, to assist. He said, so I'm going to make the decision for you. You're not going back. And it, I reverted back into almost my 10 year old self where my dad was in charge and he was making decisions on my behalf. But actually, it was exactly what I needed at the time. And it was, it was he said then, you know, look, we've got the family business. The Crusader First Aid um, is something he established uh, when he retired. Um, and he said, look, you know, it's there. If you want to come on board, you know, he said, I'm looking at stepping back and sort of semi retiring and things like that. You can take over and um, we can keep it going and all those sorts of things. And actually, it was then a sort of a, a realization of perhaps there is a life beyond it and i i recognize now that I'd, I'd also become become what i, I talk about in uh, therapy you know when i'm coaching clients was i became a slave to my pension and i basically um was working to earn a pension at 60 that would give me a quality of life when i retired but then actually what i was actually doing was working myself into the ground that i would never get to the place where i was able to spend the pension because I was, you know, as I said to a, a friend of mine, um, I was on a one-way highway to either a stroke or a heart attack. That's how I felt with the stress and the pressure of it. And, you know, there's startling statistics. An awful lot of heads don't make it past their 65th birthday, uh, having retired from headship at 60. And I didn't want to be a statistic. So that kind of was a catalyst as well. So pension slavery, I think, is a real issue. And I, I, I use the word slavery very, sort of, almost, not flippantly, but... It was just I was enslaved to it in terms of there was no way out of this. I couldn't get away from the fact that actually 
I had to keep going because my pension. And actually, when I looked at it in the cold light of day, I recognised that it was absolute rubbish and that there were alternatives. And now looking back on it, I can't believe that I carried on so long because of a pension. And when I talked to head teacher colleagues and other teachers who, let's face it, teaching is the hardest it's probably ever been now. Uh, the teaching profession is on its knees in so many ways. And um, a lot of people say, well, I feel stuck because what about my pension? And then that I work an awful lot with people about actually saying there's always an alternative. There's always a way out. And so having a plan B was one of my big things about my reboot and um, making sure that I did. And actually my plan B is, is, is no um, poor substitute for plan A. You know, it's, it's actually better. It's given me a quality of life and uh, an appreciation for things I, I've never had before in my working life and um yeah so it's that sort of thing so i owe an awful lot to to an awful lot of people but particularly my my family particularly my wife and my parents and uh siblings and uh, my friends my children are such an inspiration and so do you know what life isn't as complicated as we make it recovery now you know it's, it's something I, I i think i'll always have to manage my mental health and i think like we all do but now i've got a much better understanding of it um you know i no longer suffer with depression and things like that but now it's a case of making sure that other people don't suffer in silence because they're embarrassed or they feel they're not able to articulate uh, to someone that they're struggling because these well, we've all heard it you know, you know men don't don't talk about it and uh, it's still these are the case it's getting better but there's still an awful lot of stigma for everyone but particularly men and so that's where now I'm kind of getting to the position in, in I'm able to help people stop them falling into the boat that I fell into and um and hopefully get them to a place where they're in a really good mental health state and we talk about mental health like we do physical health and that's my now my mission in life is to to smash the stigma and um, which is where working with you and others um, has come in and uh, we're, we're working on that together so it's really exciting yeah so um just kind of taking us back to um maybe your lowest point this is a question that i get asked a lot and i don't know if you get asked this question a lot um but people will often say to me they they, they think that perhaps you know uh, suicide ideation or it is like almost you have decided it's like that's it you've you've made your mind up and and, and you're gonna go and and you're gonna go and do it they don't necessarily think that there's um let's say it sort of a, a scale where from a to b where you might start have fleeting thoughts maybe to extensive thoughts to detailed planning to what where do you think do you think you'd made your mind up or um you know where did you you know when we obviously we train that in a certain way but where do you think kind of looking at kind of how we train it and kind of where you were at um you know, because when I got to my lowest point, my lowest was my lowest point was I just don't know if I can carry on. I, I don't even know whether it was kind of whether I really had suicidal ideation or anything like that. I probably hadn't even got to that point, but it was just like I am physically and emotionally gone, and I do not see a way forward. Um, and I need and something needs to change, and I really don't know how um so with with you kind of thinking about sort of that scale and you know had you absolutely made your mind up yeah um i completely agree it is a scale and it's a sliding scale i would an analogy i kind of use is the is standing on the 10 meter diving board and you you know you tom daly climbs the steps to the 10 meter board as soon as you're on the platform you're on the board um, it doesn't mean you're on the edge of it and actually every step you take forward or backward moves you along the you know, so you're still on that diving platform but it's not you're not necessarily on the edge ready to go um i think in terms of where the suicidal ideation came in with me where it, it started you know we know that a lot of a lot of people um in their life have fleeting thoughts of it and suicidal ideation is, is more much more common than people would care to admit the where i got to was i i sort of had made a plan in the um it was almost not not the driver wasn't that it wasn't i can't carry on although i did feel like that but the actual driver for me where where it differentiates itself i think from perhaps where you just articulated your position being was i had that feeling of i don't know what else i can do 
but then for me it was also the added pressures of um financial uh, so it was if i if i can't be a head teacher anymore if i can't earn that salary how can we afford to keep the house how can we afford to live um and so it was the practicalities of it as well became and i became very practical at that point which is you know, looking back on it it's sort of i look back on it almost with a little bit of black humor in terms of the the dark nature of um where i was at but the 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 reset i think came from the realization that actually if i was dead uh everyone else would be better off financially because my life insurance would pay out and i checked that so i was in the mindset where i was able to check to check going you know, to double check to make sure that my because i'd had it for a, a long time um there wasn't you know, i think if you most for most suicide things and clauses in there are like you know 12 if you commit suicide within 12 months of having the policy it doesn't pay I'd had the policy for years and I checked all that stuff. So the small print. So that I was, I was at that point of actually checking to make sure that if I do do this, uh, will my wife be okay? Will my children be okay? Will my, you know, will my estate make sure that they're okay? And my okay was, will they be financially viable? Not what's the trauma this is going to cause, you know, and we look at adverse childhood experiences as a, a, an indicator for life chances and things like that. Well, I didn't enter into that process. I was entering into it from a purely practical view of, if I'm not here, the mortgage will be gone. So therefore, um, you know, the financial burden will be gone. But if I if I leave teaching, then my wife's going to have to get a different job. Um, she was working, but she's going to have to do different. So if she's working now full time, then the children will have to go into a childcare, uh, which would mean that they'd have to from school have to be picked up. Blah blah blah. And so it's the ramifications of my inability to be a head teacher. Um, had ramifications on everyone else so it meant that their quality of life I perceived it to be would be different and would be worse so actually by me making the choice to end my life actually some something in my mind thought that was a rational thing to actually say um, that's a good thing because actually everyone else would be all right then and the, the implications for them will be okay because actually mum won't have to work full time because the mortgage will be paid off that means children might have to go into after school care or child minders um so that's good and you know then they should only have to earn a certain amount which she already does which will pay for the bills and will pay for their living and blah blah so all these things came into my thought process which now when i look back on it i'm like why do we how did i get to that but it was purely practical elements so yes my su suicidal ideation got to the planning stage but what i would say in answer to your question is that um people think once they have suicidal ideation that becomes suicide it doesn't and far fewer people actually commit the act um, than you know, having been on the suicidal um, sort of ideation spectrum. People don't get to the edge of the diving board and actually take the jump, uh, metaphorically, uh, as you know, more people walk back down the stairs than actually jump off the diving board. So that's where I was. And I started then walking my way back down off the diving board, down the stairs and back onto the pool side where I was able to seek help from the professionals there. And so, yeah, I'd say that people do ask me about that um i think it's really important we talk about suicide and i think it's still one of those societal taboos that we still don't talk about it enough uh because it's you know, it is what it is it's something that i i was thinking about um you know i didn't do and it's about making sure that you know, we recognize that people do get into that desperate state you know and it's a as, as i so talk about it now and if i heard it for soundbite from someone i'm not sure where i, where I heard it now but I use the phrase, you know, it's a temporary, or sorry, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that's what suicide is, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And, and um, now viewing, viewing it through those eyes, now I work with people when they have been in those bad places and, um, and help them to understand that actually it's okay to think that and it's okay to, you know, to do that, but it's actually forgiving yourself for doing that. And I think that's something I still struggle with is forgiving myself. Um, and I still have to battle that. And I still, you know, the the guilt is still there. Um, and I think it always will be. I think it's one of those things I harbour still. Um, I try not to, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm human and uh, uh, certainly not perfect. And so it's, yeah, just doing that. So I think the suicidal ideation thing is definitely a spectrum. And where I was, was not completely on the edge, but not far off. Yeah. Um, but then you know, I quickly sort of started backtracking back down off the diving board and back down the steps and things like that. So, yeah, no, just because you think it doesn't mean you have to do it. 
um, there's always other options and there's you know in fact i would implore anyone who's ever you know getting to that point of just pick up the phone just breathe for a second you know just take some time um you know just think about it sleep on it you know things will always be better and things can always get better it's just about talking to the right people seeking the advice from the right people and um and taking it minute by minute you know sometimes a day is too long you know yeah. like some of the clients i work with you know, sometimes five minutes is too long so it's just literally me sitting there and talking to them and you know having their conversation but actually just taking that pause to breathe and uh taking a big deep breath and just just talking to ourselves kindly and compassionately and um, because that internal voice i think is, is a big driver with the ideation and um if we if we're kind to ourselves then people wouldn't get to that point but we, it's because we you know we, we can be so negative to ourselves so that was one point um where 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 we have to be very very thankful to boris yes absolutely doesn't happen very often these days does it <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah five years on i still every day now now i've trained him he actually responds to doris and morris in the park so when we're around i don't have to shout out boris come here or good boy boris <laughs> that's so really just so you really isn't, isn't it thing to be shouting today, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah absolutely but do you know what i think that's the thing we've, we've now got bridey as well so boris has got a little companion now a greyhound and uh bridey's just like that and, and in terms of the importance of things uh, well, some part of my self-care is is about dog walking but it's also about the unconditional affection and love you get from pets and it's so good for our well-being just to be able to just sit and just you know i'll, I'll, I'll go out for five minutes come back and the dogs are like i've been away for a year you know and it's lovely to have that um but yeah animals i've, I've always been an animal lover and, and they've been amazing and uh yeah, and some during lockdown, there was some, some sort of points where I thought, you know what, do I actually prefer animals to people or dogs to people? I think well, some days I might, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I would, I would recommend um, you know, having uh, an outlet. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, yeah, I love I love my black dog. Yeah. Um, how do you switch off so you can switch on and perform at your best? Uh, do you know what? This is something I really, really had to concentrate on because I think my previous experience is still deeply entrenched in me and i think the the brain synapses that i do when i work i still fall into the head teacher synapses that i developed um so i really have to focus on it what do i do well what i do is i make sure that the first thing i do in my diary per week is as i mentioned before is i plan my selfish time now being selfish growing up if you were ever called selfish that was a really bad thing to be called and you know it was very much a you know it was a, my my understanding of the word is overwhelmingly negative however, yeah. however being through the sort of journey that i've been through in terms of my well-being i now view selfish as a really positive word because if i if i'm not selfish and i don't take time every day for me then i can't be the person i want to be for everyone that i love so i can't be you know i've got the headspace to be the dad or the or the husband or the brother or the son or the friend um because you just get to that point where actually the you know part of poor mental health is you know your so you know, your social aspect completely dwindles and you isolate yourself which is what i did so i have to pad in my selfish time so for example um tonight i'm going to go and do a run so I've taken up running again. So in January, I started the, the Couch to 5K, um, which was quite a humbling thing. I was always quite liked running, but I hadn't done it for such a long time, you know, when I was talking about my self-medication and stuff. And so I was grossly unfit and overweight. And um, so I started that with my daughter and we ran for 60 seconds, then 90 seconds. And we did that eight times. And I nearly had to go and find out where the nearest defibrillator was because I thought, <laughs> you know, this, is, this isn't going to end well. Um, <laughs> So my couch to 5k you know, i was asking joe wiley she was saying to me you're doing really well i went joe you can't see me you wouldn't be saying that if you could see me um but the the yeah that started a journey and, and reintroduction really to running for me so now i'm uh since january i've i've uh you know run dozens and dozens of 10ks um you know that's now kind of a a a, a a, a, an okay distance to go and do now i can do that and you know, so which is ridiculous when i look back in january if you'd said that to me then there's no way um a good friend of mine signed me up to do a half marathon uh, oh sorry next good friend he knows who he is 
<laughs> and, uh, yes, I did a half marathon for the first time and that was amazing and uh, training for that. So yeah, so that's something. So physical activity. So whether it be cycling, whether it be a, um, a, a run or something like that is really important. Now, one of the other things I do every day is I mood gauge. And that's something I learned from you, Emma, when we were doing the training in Bath and introduced that to me. And that's been a massive game changer for me. Um, so what I do, and I, and I do this with my clients as well, is, is I have three times a day I mood gauge. So in the morning when I wake up and I take the dogs out on the dog walk, I mood gauge myself. So out of 10, what would I score my mood this morning? And um, then I do the same at like around about lunchtime or the middle of the day at some point. And then I do it just before bedtime. And I do that. And then the it gives me a real idea because if I'd done that whilst I was a head teacher, and when my poor mental health started, I would have spotted myself falling before I did. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, I would have probably been a two or a three for for two or three years. I was pretending I was a six or a seven, which in itself is exhausting. Uh, but I would have recognised it. And actually, you know, I might have had spikes where I might have been a seven or an eight one day. Because that's the other thing people don't tend to understand about poor mental health is they think if you're depressed, you've got to walk around miserable the whole time. And that's what I talk to people. You know, we can be anyone could be depressed but you can mask it and yeah. actually there are days when you feel okay you know and you can smile and laugh and be normal but then the the low mood takes over again you know and it's almost like you know you feel bad for doing that and certainly when I was off work um and I was off work sick you know I couldn't go out because I thought what if someone sees me out they're going to say well he doesn't look well you know, he didn't look sad so it's almost like you it becomes worse because you isolate yourself further because you feel like you should be you know, limping or, you know, crying or something or doing something so people can identify the fact you're not well. So the mood gauge aspect has been really positive for me because actually if I've had a bad day, so say, for example, last week I'd had a day where I was just sort of uh, really, really busy, hadn't had pause for breath, you know, and um, and I scored myself, I think at lunchtime, I scored myself a four or a five. And I was like, oh, right, okay, you need to do something about that now. So now I know I've got a self-care toolkit I know if I do, if I go for a run, if I'm a four and I go for a run, that's going to be a plus two or three effect on yeah, my mental yeah, and my well-being. Yeah. So I know that I could turn that four now into a seven just by going for a run. Yeah. And so now I know in my toolkit, I've got those things. Whereas before I've had a bad day at work, let's have a glass of wine. Yeah. And the glass of yeah. wine immediately feels you, you know, makes you feel better because it's the euphoria of alcohol that represses and uh, depresses your, your thoughts and feelings. So that might have felt like I've gone from a four into a six or a seven or maybe a nine, but then suddenly it comes plummeting down. So where I was a four, I've gone to a nine with the euphoria of the alcohol. But when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, I'm a two. And so those dark thoughts start to creep back in again. So that's one thing. So the, so the self-care in terms of that uh, meditation. So I, I do breathing exercises. So that was that was what I started to do in the acute stage of poor health. I started doing breathing exercises. So abdominal breathing and the uh, mindfulness exercises. So I you know, YouTube eight minute body scans and things like that. There's a quick meditation. So I do that, but also I meditate when I'm walking as well. So if I'm walking the dogs or I'm running, um, I'll meditate whilst I'm doing that. So repetitive thoughts or something, you know, just re re responding to a, an image or a stimuli. The last thing I do uh, in terms of wellness is gratitude listing. Yeah. And the concept of gratitude listing when I started my sort of well-being journey or whatever you want to call it sounded really cringeworthy to me. I just felt a bit oh about it. It was like it was almost like a Disney effect of you know you had to be happy and you had to be like you know, what's that? Like, hi how are you and I'm great you know it's all Disney for everything and it was all a bit cringe. Actually now I've kind of I've got myself a little watered down version of gratitude listing that I can I don't feel too cringy. It's quintessentially English gratitude listing. And it's um, it's not quite as uh, in your face as I, I think perhaps I'd, I'd uh, envisioned it to be. But what I do on my walk, on my commute in, uh, on my walk in the morning or in my commute um, into work, I think about three things from the day before that I'm grateful for. And I think about little things, you know, and um, when people ask me about, well, what sort of things do you put on your gratitude list? Because when you start gratitude listing, it's really difficult to to A, find three things that you think are positives because quite a lot of the time you, you can't see it. When I was depressed, like I said to you at the beginning, I was, I was in a state of nothingness. Mm -hmm. So you just get to the point where you just can't see good or bad. It's all just dark. 
it's all just gray bland sort of beige world and so what we do with gratitude listing is actually train our brain to see the positives and to every day i start my day by pre-framing from the positives from the day before so when you start to look at what the positives are you actually retrain or i retrain my synapses to stop looking for negative and start looking for positive so now my instant reaction now because i've done it for a you know, period of time so you do it for three weeks it becomes a habit um my instant thing now is i'll see the positive before i see a negative and it's an amazing game changer for me so the three things it's, it's insignificant things you know it's this it's um like yesterday the my gratitude listening from yesterday one was about the dogs uh one was about a comment my wife made to me that really made me chuckle and the others was uh the other ones were about um my son and daughter they again made me uh laugh when i was bringing their dinner into them and um and they, they something they did about dinner and the comments they made and it just was just a chuckle thing a little tiny moment so my gratitude list isn't my family and isn't my job and isn't my dogs or big things it's tiny little snippets yeah and so if we, if we concentrate on the little snippets and we're grateful for those tiny little morsels then everything else just starts to be pre-framed so they're the three things that i rely upon heavily is my self-care in terms of exercise meditation um breathing and then the mood gauge to catch myself before I fall, but also to celebrate yeah. how yeah. What a good place I'm in now. Because so my average now is probably a seven or an eight. Yeah. But my average then is yeah. probably a two or a three. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't aware of it. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. And but, then the last bit is the gratitude. Yeah, being thankful for the little things, not the not the big sort of enormous things that I was looking at before, because the enormous things, well, if something goes wrong in an enormous thing, that's that you're you're in a negative within it. But if you just find the little tiny bits, then pre-frames it so yeah and i would massively agree with that um a technique i use um with people to try and get them to start thinking about gratitude is doing is listing um get them to list the things they're grateful for and they start doing that and then they go right 10 more right 10 more because we go from this place of Oh, I'm grateful for my the job or my family or whatever. And it's actually trying to narrow it down to find those little teeny weeny things that we're grateful for each day. So that's sort of how I try and do it to get people to a point where they're like, ah, right, okay, I get it now. Um, because it's, you know, when we try and think of those big things, often it doesn't resonate in the same way and it doesn't train our brain in the same way as finding those little things. If you were to share anything with our listeners um, about, you know, how they can flourish in life, what would it be? I would, something I, I do with myself and others is to ask them to give themselves. So if you, if you were giving yourself advice, so say, for example, I was giving myself advice about, what's important what would I tell myself if I was doing that so rather than me thinking about what's important what advice would I give myself so I've got a problem how would I you know what advice would I would I would I tell David and by thinking about myself in the third person um that's quite a valuable way to, to see the bigger picture tip my top tip for for what I would 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 implore other people to have and this is something I still need to work on myself but certainly to flourish I think it's kindness and I think it's it's modeling kindness to other people and to, you know, to to be kind to others, but most importantly about being kind to yourself. Yeah. Because if we're not kind to ourselves, we'll never reach a mental health utopia. Mm. Um, I'm in a far better place than I ever have been uh, with my mental well-being. Uh, but I still am not kind to myself all the time, you know, and I, I'm better at catching yeah. myself now yeah. doing it. But I'm still not perfect in terms of doing that. So my a very long and windy way of saying it, I suppose, is just be kind to yourself and actually learn to love yourself because loving yourself isn't arrogance, it's compassion, it's kindness, and it's essential for us to be able to live our lives fully and making sure that our, live, our life lived is not a job title or a bank account. A life lived is memories, it's love, it's laughter. And I think that's the important thing now I've recognised is actually my success isn't measured in in job titles or my cv um, my success is measured in my legacy and my legacy is 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 uh you know in a very strong position in terms of i've got 
amazing people around me. Um, I've got amazing you know, loved ones. I've got an amazing existence and I'm doing something now that I care passionately about and I'm making a difference in a different way. So yeah. rather than imparting knowledge and independent thinking skills and stuff like that to children, I'm now in a position whereby I can help people when they're feeling bad or you know, feeling poorly, uh, but also changing the way we talk about this. You know, So the fact you're doing this podcast is something your legacy you know, that listeners will will learn from and hopefully take on and empathize and uh, and hopefully resonate with that actually they might be able to learn and, and to share to, to share their story because i think the more of us who do the more people will come forward with their own stories about positive and negative uh, but i think if you can see that actually rather than facebook and instagram being full of shiny examples of this is what life is i look at my great life and blah, all this complete fabrication um, if people are just real about it and say, Do you know what, I've really struggled at times, but actually I'm in a good place now, or actually I really struggled at times and I'm struggling now, then the you know, kindness takes over. Those people will just be washed up and uh, enveloped in kindness. And actually that's the society that I want to bring my children up into, not one where we just purely think about ourselves in terms of what, what's in it for me. Yeah. It's not about, you know, it's not about that, is it? We know one of the ways to well the five ways to well-being that the NHS uh, developed and, and talk about, and we we talk about in training quite a lot, is giving. Yeah. You know, and actually, by giving of our time and giving ourselves to others, we actually enhance our mental health. So that yeah, so that giving giving kindness. So give it to myself first. Make sure I've got enough in, that I've got a cup that I can pour from, that I can share. And once I do that, and once I've once I've perfected it, I'll let you know because I'm still well well off. But um, it's a mission that, yeah, to be kind to myself and then then I've got plenty of give that I can give to others as well. And I think, you know, the key thing that I've really learned is that mental well-being is something that you invest in and it's something, it is dynamic, just like what you said at the beginning. And, you know, it can change and it is about keeping that, you know, monitoring it so that you know when you slip in but also knowing what to do to kind of bring yourself back to where you need to be. And, you know, I don't think my mental well-being is, is something, it's not a box that I've ticked. You know, I still have crap days now and again, but it doesn't mean to, but it's, it, but it's more about myself, the way I handle that and that self-reflection to kind of go, okay, I'm aware that that's dropped. And I've done enough development to know what I can actually do myself to make that, you know, make it better. So what is it that I've not done today? Oh, mm, or yesterday, actually, I didn't go for two walks. I only went for one, you know, it could be something as basic as that, or something is, you know, worrying me emotionally. So how do I kind of, how do I deal with that emotional well-being? And, having different techniques to be able to support yourself and just, you know, giving yourself what you need and something that I just want to say as well, and we will move on to, to the next little topic, but something I just want to say to you is when you get that guilt about when you look back and you get, get that guilt, I think something that you need to write down somewhere is you were ill. Yeah, Absolutely. You were real. You were in a place where, you know, you were poorly, yeah. and that's that wasn't David. This is David. Absolutely, and I would, I completely agree with that. And so it's, yeah, so thank you for that because it's um, I lose sight of that an awful lot. And my therapist said that to me at the time. You know, if you were well, would you have thought that? And I said, no, absolutely not. I've got to be kind to myself about that and um, just say that I wasn't well. You know, it wasn't me. It isn't there. And, but thank you for reminding me of that because you know sometimes we do need those little reminders just to to appreciate that. So that's um yeah that's going to feature on my gratitude list tomorrow. I'll, I'll text you. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, that's all right. So um something else that we just wanted to share as well, a topic that we wanted to talk about. So um my kind of previous experience, I was working with schools for approximately like twelve years and working with teachers. Um, around you know to help them to be great great at their great at their jobs and when I kind of came when I kind of made my transition into my the direction that I'm in now it always hankered in the back of my mind 
that there was something that needed to be done um, for, uh, you know, for children in schools. There was something, there was a different way, you know, I've been a governor. I hadn't realized for how long I've been a governor for about eight years. Um, And, and so it's been that kind of, that next generation is so important to me. And I've always had this vision in my mind of what, what I wanted to sort of create. And last year, I was fortunate enough to say, I'm saying fortunate enough, but last year, <laughs> I was really fortunate enough to write a uh, young people's, uh, children and young people's mental health and well-being uh, course uh, with um, a couple of other ladies. And I, it's what? It's brilliant. Well, I mean, you did, I mean, I, you trained on it, didn't you? Sort of when we, yeah. as soon as we kind of d- developed it. Yeah. And um, your words were, this is game changing for schools. And it's, for me, it wasn't, it was just, we sat there and between us, um, you know, very much one from a real sort of therapeutic angle, one from very much sort of behavior and, um, you know, head teacher angle and me with this real driver of of these gaps that I'd seen. Um, And we put this course together and then, um, you know, and which which we've been fortunate enough to train other trainers in this year. Now, when um, then I was approached about applying for some funding for for uh, DFE that there was this uh, the senior mental health lead training uh funding that's available for schools and the idea is that in every single school across the UK there will be a senior mental health lead um, that is trained and that is responsible and is driven to create a whole school approach to mental health and well-being so what happened with that was I applied for, um, I started to um, think about how we could put this together. So it was almost like, what is it that they're wanting? And, and what is what are these elements? And basically there's eight principles within the um, Public Health England's like desire report to say that um, these, these are the things that you know you should be covering. And then as we kind of looked at that, of what they wanted in this training, it was like, mm, we've kind of already pretty much done that. It was like, were we psychic? Or actually, did we know what schools needed? <laughs> so this kind of real desire, so that came from a real concept of sort of four or five years ago, kind of was brought to life. We wrote it last year and was brought to life really at the end of last year, early this year. And what... The bit for me was the bit that was missing really was the implementation parts. That's a lot of the work that I do with, you know, with with organizations now is the strategy side and um, and actually that coaching support to be able to put in place um, to implement it, implement it successfully and to ensure that you get the outcomes that you want, that you need and that we need within schools to support both the pupils but also the staff so that's sort of the angle that we came from we've made a you know some some tweaks to to the course um and we have then bolted um bolted support around it to make sure that it's you know implemented strongly so that schools get the outcomes that they want and to be able to do that um i my immediate thought was Mm, I know I know a man who would be um, great to be involved in this project so there's a number of us that have now partnered on this so that we can cover this nationally and um, yeah so we're, we're, we're delivering that nationally so if you have any contacts with any schools or you are responsible for uh, anything to do with schools or you work with schools or you've got relationships with schools reach out to us because we are looking for people to help us get the message out there um and also obviously if you're interested in attending our program then we would love to give you more details and um if you got any kind of from a real kind of ex-head teacher's perspective you know what you think our program brings yeah, I mean, the 
it's so exciting because I share your passion for educating the next generation. I think our children are already getting much more sort of advanced input than we ever did in our uh, when we were at school. I work with ambassadors now and train sort of you know six formers or year elevens, year tens, some year sixes, year fives to become mental health ambassadors for their organisations. And it, every time I work with those they, those groups, it fills me with nothing but hope. Um, that actually, this mental health pandemic that we're in um, will be that will be a thing of the past. And when our children are talking about you know, to their children about mental well being, it will be something they just talk about over the dinner table. And I think that's the journey that we're on. I think the the training that you developed and that we're going to be delivering uh, you know, through the DfE funding is a real game changer. And I used that expression when I first did the, chain, the training with you. Uh, I think the, the reason being that it's empowering schools to empower the children to own their mental well-being, but also doing it in a way whereby we are able to put scaffolds in place that the school can build their well-being strategies around. So it's not going to be a massively onerous piece of work for schools to take on board. And I think, you know, we, we all know how hard teachers work and certainly, you know, head teachers and senior leaders are already got so many things on their plates that uh, they, uh, they, uh, their capacity is really, really small at the moment. This is the, 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 the course that we've designed and you know, that we're delivering that, you're, you, know, that you, you were talking about briefly just before. It does those things for the school that by attending the training, they will have a scaffold of a development plan for well-being uh, that should be then easy then to, to implement into their school school development policies and strategies that they already do. So it's not creating more work. It's just simply honing what they already do to make sure that well-being is at the centre of it. And I talked to a lot about my you know, schools and things like that, about having well-being in the DNA of the school, not just the tick box exercise. So that everything we do within a school development plan has well-being at its heart. And that's what's the impassioned bit about it is because well-being isn't a tick box. It isn't a, an ancillary thing that we just do just to keep Ofsted off our back or anything like that. Well-being is driven everything we do because if, if, we, if we look at everything that we do as a school through the well-being sort of, uh, telescope, then actually then that means that our staff are going to be really well served, but the children are going to be really well looked after, uh, not just from a, a physical perspective and to make sure that they're safeguarded, but within the training itself, we look at what is, you know, when is it a mental health issue or when is it a behaviour issue or when is it a special educational and di disability need? So differentiating between those things, that actually we're not treating someone who's got a symptom of their poor mental health is their behaviour. Uh, we're able to identify that the, 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 the issue is the mental health um, and actually putting things in place. So I think it's, in, it's an all-encompassing package and I think really one of the added, the added things to it is the support we put aside. So the coaching, the eight hours coaching contact time uh, that we do as part of the package as well is such a unique thing that we can offer. And with the experience of, you know, of teachers, head teachers, coaching, uh, mental health professionals, or the team that we've built and you've put together is brilliant. You know, I, I would call us, you know, go as far as to say you sort of like a, the mental health Avengers. You know, so the Avengers assemble, you know, and I think we're, we we just got to get capes sorted out, you know. <laughs> the only problem is you put a cape on me, I look like a teddy tubby. The, uh, well, you have got a Batman costume. I do have a Batman costume, you're quite right. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's one of those things now. I think we've we've got a really good, uh, you know, sort of programme. We've got brilliant people to deliver it. We've got national coverage. We've got the infrastructure in place to support schools after they've done the training, because what we don't want it to be is just you come along on the training and then you go back and have to do it by yourself. We've got the group networking sessions. We've got the one to one peer coaching. We've got the group coaching. That means actually we're with you every step of the way on the implementation of this into your setting. And we're not going to just walk away. We're not going to be a training provider that tells you what to do and then walks away. We're going to be a training provider that tells you these are the options who coach you through what's best for your setting, coach you through what's best for your school and support you in the implementation and the long-term aims of that. This isn't a, a one-trick pony sort of scenario of buy it and then off you go. We're going to be there to support the imp implementation and the, the evaluation of your, of your school's progress in their wellbeing journey. And as a former head teacher, to have that support on hand is absolutely a game changer for me. 
and um, and uh, with the utilizing the expertise that we have in our team within our Avengers, then we can uh, uh, we can we can touch all bases. So it's really really exciting. And the fact of it as well is that the funding is there. You know, the the, the government have recognised this, and the DFP have released funding that will pay for the course, will pay for the coaching, but also pay for that member of staff's cover costs when they're doing the training as well. So, you know, you send that member of staff away, it's all well and good them saying, okay, yeah, we're going to fund the training. I know that's a £400 you know, on cost in terms of the supply costs for me for covering that teacher for two days. Um, but now that's covered as well. That's within the package. So there is really no reason. There's no, all the barriers that we're trying to uh, um, envisage have been removed. So now it's about getting schools to actually, A, understand this funding available because a lot of schools that I, te I talk to now have no idea the funding's there. And that's the, where that communication breakdown's happened. I have no idea, but we've got to make sure that they are aware of it. But equally recognising this funding isn't there forever. They've got to jump on board and get the funding, apply for it through the DfE, give us a ring. We can talk them through the process. Um, but yeah, the, the, our unique selling point is that individual element that we're able to support you beyond the training days. We've got the face-to-face -face training as well, which I know as a head teacher, I really valued those days of face-to-face -face as opposed to it being virtual or on a learning platform when you go through and tick a box and you know, sort of those sorts of training. I got much more from being in the, in the flesh and asking the questions of the trainer, like I did when I did the training with you and we're in Bath. That really enriches the process for me. And that's what we're giving. But we're also giving the flexibility of the coaching online. So once you're back in your setting, we can, you know, I could be sitting with you in your, in your office, having that conversation virtually um, and sharing documents and utilizing the, the sort of, you know, the technology benefit or technological benefits and advances that actually lockdowns really promoted for all of us, isn't it? Uh, Zoom and all that sort of stuff, Teams and all those sorts of things. Before, so before lockdown, I was really showing my sort of, uh, you know, my, my age in that regard of going, what, what's Zoom? What's this? What's that? Um, <laughs> But yeah. nowadays, you know, it's a lot of what we do is, is online and that's been a real step forward. So brilliant. I think this is a game changer. And I think that you know, get into get into people before their mental health becomes a problem and being very proactive about it is so much better than the sticking plaster approach we adopt now, where CAMS referrals, you know, getting children's mental health services are so stretched because there's so many people at the acute stage. I remember as a head having to have a conversation with a, a, a CAMS worker. Um, who said to me, you know, I had, a, I had a child who was suicidal and their, their, their sort of benchmarking was have they tried or have they made an attempt on their own life? And I'd say, no, they hadn't. And they said, well, I'm sorry, they don't make threshold. And that's what I was being told by CAMS professionals. Unless they tried to end their own life, they didn't meet threshold for intervention. That's just the way of the world. You know, the, the systems are overcome. You know, they're overwhelmed. This is about changing cultures, changing our attitude towards mental health, smashing that stigma and being part of it, I think it's hugely encouraging. I'm delighted that you know the, the different political parties are taking mental health and putting mental health on the uh, manifestos for the, the upcoming um, general elections and things like that when they happen. So all of that stuff can only be positive. Um, you know, now that one one uh, political party has put it on, they'll all have to now. So it's now firmly on the agenda and we're at the opportunity to get going before um, that actually kicks in as well. So I would implore any head teachers listening or any teachers listening, any people who obviously care about mental well-being from listening to this podcast, get in touch, um, you know, get on board and, you know, and, and make a difference to those children, make a difference to your staff, empower your staff to be the people who can make the difference. This isn't about another uh, another thing to add to a job description or uh, to their workly day uh, workload. This is about empowering ourselves to spot the signs early and having systems in place to to offer uh, support to stop people becoming acute and stop having to become referrals to CAMS. Yeah, and yes, so can't wait to be involved um, in that. It's we've literally just had approval end of well this month wasn't it two weeks yeah, ago yeah. and so yeah so yeah definitely um get in touch for those that have are applying for funding now um the courses need to have been started i believe um by some point in march there is additional funding coming out it was supposed to be by 20 everyone done 
and in place by 2025. There's now um, some information to say that they want that done by 2023. So um, yeah, don't um, don't wait and miss out on on uh, an opportunity of you know of some you know funded support for your school. And if you're a parent with a child in a school that um, you perhaps think that the school perhaps need a little bit of them, then maybe you should point them in our direction as well and get them to have a look at what we're offering. So. Um, Thank you so much, David, for coming on today. I know I've pet your head quite a few times to ask you to tell your story. Anyway, I've now bribed him enough to um, come on. So, that, so that's good. But thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Human Reboot podcast. I'm Emma Last. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five star podcast review and visit thehumanrebootmovement.com where you can find downloadable free resources, sign up to my mailing list or connect with me on social. So that's thehumanrebootmovement.com. Let's switch off so we can switch on. It's time for your human reboot.